Ephesians chapter 2. Glory to God. Ephesians chapter 2, beginning at verse 19. Hallelujah. Do you love Jesus this morning? Mighty God. Mighty God. Ephesians 2, starting at verse 19. When you're there, say amen. amen. Now, therefore, everybody say now. Aren't you glad the past is over? Mighty God. Aren't you glad your past is over? I don't know about you. I'm glad my past is over. Thank God my yesterdays are gone. <sighs> Glory. Now, therefore, you are no longer strangers and foreigners, but are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, having been built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone, in whom the entire building, tightly framed together, grows into a holy temple in the Lord in whom you also are being built together into a dwelling place of God through the Spirit. And I want to minister this morning what I believe to be a prophetic word, what I believe to be an on-time word for this house, for this church, for Souls Harbor in this hour. No, I didn't talk to Pastor about what he was revealed by the Lord yesterday morning, or this morning rather. This is something that the Lord put on my heart. This is something that God's been dealing with me and been dealing with my wife for a while about. But I want to use this text this morning to minister on the subject, a home, a plug, and a hub. Hallelujah. A home a plug, and a hub. Only God, Pastor. Only God. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, again, for your precious, precious presence that's in this place. God, we thank you that you don't leave us as orphans, God, but you come unto us. Holy Spirit, that you move in our midst, God, that you move in us. Lord God, and in you we move and we dwell and we have our being. Lord, let everything that we do just as earlier, in the earlier part of this service. Lord, let everything we do from this point forward be to your glory. Lord, we take up, we just, we lay aside every agenda, every plan that we have for the rest of the day, every purpose, any preconceived notions about how today was going to go. And we say, Holy Spirit, have your way. God, we want what you want. We're your children, and we're endeavoring to walk in the Spirit. We're endeavoring to keep in step with the Spirit. That when you say go, we say where. When you say turn, you say we say which way. God, we want what you want. Lord, I ask you to hide me behind the cross of Calvary. Let everything I say and do be done in love, be preached in love, and all to the glory of Jesus and your finished work at the cross of Calvary. Because, Lord, if it had not been for that day on Golgotha's hill, none of us, none of us would be justified in your sight. But because you went to that cross and took our sin and came up out of that grave three days and three nights later, we are justified, we are washed, we are sanctified, and we are precious in your sight, Father. Lord, we thank you, we praise you, and we give you all the glory. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen, amen, and amen. Hallelujah. You may be seated. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. The other day, I was praying. It was on our, actually, our Tuesday night weekly uh, prayer meeting that we have here every Tuesday night at 7 o'clock. I was back there by the back door, and I was praying, and the Lord brought something to my remembrance that he had actually spoke to my wife a few years ago. Um, and I hadn't thought about it in quite some time. It's interesting how the Lord does that, how things that we, we aren't even thinking about, things that we aren't even praying about, things that we aren't even dwelling on, he'll bring up in our spirit. A lot of the times that's how we know it's God. Because you're like, Lord, where in the world did that come from? 
It's not something I drummed up in my head. It's not something I was thinking about, not something I was praying about. But it's God with that still, small voice. It's God with that witness of the Holy Spirit, bearing witness with our spirit that he's got something to say. And I remember it wasn't long after Kristen had got saved that she told me the Lord had spoke to her and said, I want my church to be a home, a plug, and a hub. I said, what in the world? You sure you heard from God? But I knew. I knew that she had heard from the Lord. And she knew she had heard from the Lord. See, when God speaks, we have to know that we've heard the voice of our Father. Amen. See, we can expect, and this kind of goes along with what we're talking about in soup group. We can expect to hear the voice of God. We're his children. See, if I get on the phone and call my dad, I can expect him to answer and I can expect him to want to talk to me. Why? Because he's my dad, right? So as children of God, it's crazy to think that God doesn't want to talk to us. It's crazy to think that God doesn't have something to say to us as his children. Amen? And God, in this hour, I believe that he wants this church, this fellowship, this assembly of the saints, Souls Harbor Church, to be a home, a plug, and a hub as part of his divine plan. Let's look at our text again over in Ephesians 2. It says, now, therefore, you are no longer strangers and foreigners, but are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. See, we're a part of the household of God, like Brother David was talking about this morning. We make up a spiritual house. And the apostle Peter, he echoes this by the same spirit, amen, by the Holy Ghost over in 1 Peter 2, 5, where he says, we are living stones being built up into a spiritual house. That was something else that the Lord spoke to me that evening. That as a building is built on a foundation, right, Brother Stokely? With brick and mortar or whatever kind of building materials, right? In the same way, us as a spiritual house, that it says we are being built together into a dwelling place of God through the Spirit. We are living stones in the building of God. That spiritually we are the household of God. Let's turn over to Hebrews chapter 3, if you've got your Bibles. Hebrews chapter 3. I'm going to turn here real quick. Hallelujah. It says in verse 1, it says, Therefore, holy brothers, partakers in a heavenly calling, consider the apostle and high priest of our profession, Jesus Christ, who was faithful to him who appointed him, as Moses was faithful in all his house. For the one was counted worthy of more glory than Moses, in that he who builds the house has more honor than the house itself. Amen? For every house is built by someone, but the one, speaking of Jesus, who builds all things is God. Moses was faithful in all God's house as a servant, testifying about those things that were to be spoken later. But Christ, check this out, is faithful over God's house as a son whose house we are if we hold fast the confidence and rejoicing of our hope firm to the end. So we are, everybody say I am, a part of the household of God. See, individually we're a part of that household, right? Individually we are temples of the Holy Ghost. Praise God. Praise his name for that. Hallelujah. I was thinking this morning, thank you, Lord, I don't have to go to a temple. I don't have to fly to Jerusalem, especially right now, every time I want to talk to you. But I thank you, Holy Ghost, that you live on the inside of us, that through the blood of Jesus, because of the new covenant, that the Holy Spirit of God, the same spirit that rose Jesus from the dead, hallelujah, the same spirit that moved over the face of the waters, the same spirit that we felt his presence in this place this morning, lives on the inside of every single born-again child of God. So individually, 
Individually, we're a part of that household. But collectively, we are the household of God. Also, in the same way, just as we are the church, amen, so is this building the church. Now, check this out. Some of this might sound elementary, but that's okay. We as the church, however, aren't reliant on this building in order to be the church. Because what did he say? Where two or three are gathered in his name, I'm in the midst. That word church means ecclesia, called out ones. So we aren't reliant on this building in order to be the church. However, this building is reliant on us in order to be a church. Now, this rubs the cat's fur backwards, as Pastor says, but that's okay. And I'm not in any way, any way making light of the house of God, the physical house of God. We should honor the house of God. We should, we should respect this house. We should thank God for how beautiful it is in this place. But apart from the church, this is nothing more than a decorated building. Because we aren't contingent on the building to be the church, but the building is contingent on us in order to be the church. Amen? Without us, this church is just a building. See, God doesn't dwell in houses made with hands. And the only reason that when we're gathered together in his name that he comes down tangibly and we can feel his presence isn't because of the color of the chairs and the color of the carpet. He does it on account of us. Amen. The same presence of God that we feel in here, we can have it in our house. Amen. We can have it on the job, praise God. Last week I felt the presence of God so strong I couldn't even hardly stand up at the job on the workplace, praying with another brother in Christ. The same presence we feel in this place, we can feel in our home. We can feel on the job. We can feel anywhere, amen, when the household of God gets together. But that being said, as the house of God, as living stones, it's our duty and our responsibility to reflect in this house what we are in the spirit, does that make sense? What we are in the spirit, the household of God, it's our duty and our responsibility to make this house in the natural reflect the supernatural. See, if we're, if we're the church, if we're the household of God, when we come together in this building, in this place, in the church, in the house of God, this house, this church should reflect in the physical, in the natural, what we are in the spirit. That means that if the Bible promises me that as a child of God, that I come behind in no gift, amen, that I do not lack the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want, I'll lack for nothing, that in this house we should not lack. We should not want. We should come behind in no gift. And I'll talk about that here in a little bit. But as it is in the spirit, it should be in the natural. So if we are the household of God, or the abode of God, which an abode is a home. Amen? Is there a difference between a house and a home? Many people know that. If you've ever lived in a home, you know there's a difference between a house and a home. It becomes a home, hallelujah, when the family moves in. And this house becomes a home when the household of God has moved in. Amen? Does that make sense? See, home is somewhere, no matter where you've been, what you've done, you're always welcome. Amen? It's where your family is. Sister Bev, you, you've said so many times in Sunday school, and it's blessed me every time you say it, that your home is where your family is. It's with the family where we're at home. Amen? It's a place where we bear one another's burdens, a place where we can have R&R, &R, where we can rest and recuperate and recharge 
from the struggles of life where we can rest in our Father's presence. You remember the story of the prodigal son? I reference it a lot because God gave me probably about a year and a half ago, God gave me fresh revelation on that parable that actually ties back into my testimony about the long suffering of God, about the keeping power of God, about the seal of the Holy Spirit, about how our salvation isn't a swinging door. Amen. Because when God establishes us in Christ, he intends on keeping us in Christ. Amen. Glory to God. But the parable of the prodigal son, the two brothers, the younger one said, Dad, I'm tired of living in this house. Give me all my inheritance, and I'm hitting the road. So the father divided the inheritance, gave the younger one his money. The older one got his too in advance, but the older one decided he wanted to stay in the father's house, wanted to be faithful to the father. The younger one, you know the story, he goes off, he spends every dime he's got living wild. He ends up in a pig pen fighting a hog for his food. And when he comes home, before he even has the opportunity to beg his dad for a job working in the house, his dad falls on his neck and begins to weep and said, my son who was dead is now alive. Never even gave him the chance to be a servant. He said, you're better than that, son. You're my child. Hallelujah. We all know the story. But the older brother, see, he had indignation because he said, Dad, I've been faithful. I've been faithful. I never backslid. I never ran off to the hog pen. When I was born, see if you catch this, when I was born into this home, I stayed right next to you the entire time, my whole life since I was born. But yet, this brother of mine, who has spent all of his share of the inheritance, you throw him a party. Let none of us be like that older brother. Let us never... And I mean every single person in this room, let not one of us ever be like that older brother. Because saints, in these last days that we're living in, I want you to hear me. And this is one of the reasons I believe God wants this house to be a home, first and foremost. What did he say? Abideth these three, faith, hope, and love, but the greatest is what? It's love. Everything we do has to be done in love. Everything we say has to be said in love. The way we live out this gospel message has got to be done walking in love. Hallelujah. And in these days that we're living in, we're going to see people walk through those doors that say, I used to call this place home. And the Father regardless if you like it or not, is going to welcome them back with open arms. Put a ring on their hand. That's blessing. Whoa! Put a ring on their hand. That's blessing. Put food in their belly. That's, that's provision. That's being fed with the word of God. Hallelujah. Pouring in fresh oil and fresh wine. That's a refreshing in the Holy Ghost. Don't ever let us be like that older brother that griping, complaining older brother. Well, I never left, Dad. You never threw me no party. He was living in a mansion. They ate like that all the time. His daddy was rich. It was his own fault he didn't take the blessings and the benefits of his father in the house. Amen. Mighty God. That this has to be a place in these last days when they come back in. Hadn't been here in years. Hadn't been here in months. Hadn't been here in decades. When they walk through that door, that they feel the love of Jesus Christ through his body. Lord, make our hearts sensitive. Lord, let us walk in love toward the backslider, towards the sinner, toward the heathen. That our hearts be tender even as yours is tender, God. Mighty God. Let us have that heart of the Father. Romans 5.5, 5, he said, the love of God has been shed abroad in your heart by the Holy Ghost. That's one of the first things that the Holy Ghost does in your life is he teaches you how to love like Jesus. I talked to a brother the other day at work. 
And he said the day he surrendered his life to the Lord, now he had backslid. He had run from God, got saved as a small child. But the day he came back, started reading the Bible, he said the very next day he started calling people and making things right. Because he said, I don't have to defend myself anymore. I don't have to hold grudges anymore. There's an overwhelming love for you that I've never felt before. And he began to make things right with people that he was at odds with. See, the fruit of the Spirit, what's the first one mentioned? Love. Let us have the love of the Father. Let us have the heart of the Father. So number one, God wants his church to be a home. Somewhere that saints can come and just be real. Amen. Somewhere we don't have to wear a mask. You don't have to fake it around your family. At least you shouldn't. Amen. A place where you can just come and be real. And a place that no matter where you've gone, no matter how far you've ran, you can always come back to. Amen. He wants his church to be a home. Number two. God desires his church to be a plug, a place where the believer can come in and get plugged in, get rooted and taught the word of God. Amen. See, I thank God, and I brag on this house a lot, but I do it all to the glory of the one who built the house, and that's the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Because according to 1 Corinthians 14, it is the will of God that when we come together, we're edified, we're comforted, and we're exhorted. Amen? That we're edified. That means we're built up, we're comforted, we're consoled from everything that we've been through. And that we're exhorted, we're admonished, we're instructed, we're encouraged. And I thank God that to many untold thousands of people, And I don't exaggerate when I say that untold thousands of people that this house over the decades, over the last 47 years has been an equipping center for the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm thankful that we're taught the word of God in this place. Amen. I'm thankful he plugged me in here. Amen. See, I, and I told Sister Beth this one time. I was quoting another gentleman that I heard it from, a minister. I truly believe that God picks your church and God picks your pastor. I firmly believe that. I don't believe that we're just supposed to be, you know, flip-flop and fly, church shopping till I die. <laughs> but I firmly believe that God has the particular soil that has the particular nutrients that you as a plant need in order to grow and be all that God has for you to be. A hundred percent. That it's God. Well, is that Bible? Yes, it's God who establishes us. Amen? It's God that establishes us. Hallelujah. I'm thankful that he plugged me in here. Let's go back over to Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 4. Praise God. Ephesians chapter 4, starting at verse 11. It says, he, speaking about Jesus, he said, he gave some to be apostles, (coughs) prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. Now, real quick, I want to make a note. God did not call fivefold ministers of the gospel in order for the fivefold ministers to lord over the people of God. That's what 1 Peter 5, 3 says, that ministers of the gospel, the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, pastors, and teachers were not given to the church by Jesus to lord over the people of God, but to literally be a vessel to be poured out for the people of God. That God chooses by his own sovereign hand, individuals, that he places a call on their life, whether it be an apostle, a prophet, evangelist, a pastor, or a teacher, and he uses them as a vessel to be poured out for the body of Christ, a sacrifice, an alabaster box, if you will, one that he can trust to be crushed, one that he trusts to be bruised, one that he trusts that come what may, Brother Ford, I can trust you 
to pour out into others even in the midst of your pain, even in the midst of your suffering. You can bless those that are going through the same thing. That apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers aren't just titles that people wear like a badge of honor and say, look who I am. and <laughs> Bless you. But the ministries of the church of the Lord Jesus Christ are the bond servants, the slaves of the Lord. Amen. And we all partake, whether we be called into those offices or not, we all partake of those offices. And we're all bond servants to the Lord. Amen. Hallelujah. Let's look at verse 11 one more time. He gave some to be apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers for the equipping of the saints for the work of the ministry or the work of service and for the building up of the body of Christ. Now, that word equipping there means to bring into a condition of fitness. So spiritually in shape, in other words. Spiritually, I don't know, somebody who hits the gym. Amen. A spiritual meathead. Can I say that? <laughs> spiritually fit. Amen. Somebody who's been conditioned spiritually. Someone who's been equipped. And that building up, that's talking about that edification. Amen. Verse 13, until we all come into the unity of the faith, and of the knowledge of the Son of God into a complete man, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, so we may no longer be children tossed here and there by waves and carried about with every wind of doctrine, by the trickery of men, by craftiness with deceitful scheming, but speaking the truth in what? In love we may grow up in all things into him who is the head, Christ himself, from whom the whole body is joined together and connected by every joint and ligament as every part effectively does its work and grows, building itself up in love. Now I want you to take specific notice of that verse. That the whole body is joined together and connected by every joint Every ligament, as every part effectively does its work. This is talking about the body of Christ. And grows, building itself up in love. See, that's the purpose of the fivefold ministry. Amen. To help teach, as the Holy Spirit has taught, amen, the truth. I mention it every time I get behind this pulpit, and I don't believe that it's, it's doing an injustice to say it again because Jesus said it so much. See that you be not deceived. There is some crazy, crazy, and I say crazy with a K, crazy, like crazy glue. There's crazy teachings out there from the pit of hell. And it says that he is anointed ministers to preach the word so that we no longer as the body be carried away, tossed about here and there by the waves, carried about with every wind of doctrine. In order to have a plug, a place where we can get plugged in and taught the word of God, the unadulterated, pure, untainted word of Almighty God, without private interpretation, without adding our own thing, without pulling out of the Scripture and making it say something it doesn't say, but letting the Bible speak for itself and teach us by the Spirit of the living God who authored it. So God wants His house to be a home. And to be a plug. Amen. See, God calls and anoints ministers to equip the saints. What's it say? For the work of service or the work of the ministry. That word in the Greek actually means to be a servant. That's what that word means. For the equipping of the saints for the work of being a servant and to edify and build up the body of Christ. That's why our pastor gets up here week after week after week and pours his heart out into us. It's not to get an amen, I promise you that. 
It's not to get a round of applause. I promise you that. That's why Brother David studies and is astute and prays about the Sunday school lessons and the messages he preaches and teaches. That's why Pastor Jose studies and prays and seeks the face of God about the word that he's to bring to the house of the Lord. That's why I seek God's face and realize that the church does not need a lean cuisine, heat up in the microwave meal, but it needs a made-from-scratch, homemade dinner. It is too late in the game. To just get up behind this sacred desk and speak whatever comes to your mind. Ministers of the gospel, at least in this church, I know, don't speak unless they know that they've heard from the Lord as to what he says in this hour for this house. Hallelujah. I thank God for that. I thank God for that. And they wouldn't be watching anyway, and they don't know where I'm at. But I've been in churches where pastors had their whole year schedule planned out in advance. Knew that in April what they was going to preach in December. I'm serious. And I'm not trying to knock anybody. But my God, we've got to be sensitive to the Holy Spirit. And that's everybody. Amen. Because every, everybody point at yourself. See, I'm sorry that I make y'all participate. I'll walk down there to you and make you do it. <laughs> no, I'm not going to do that. Lord, help me. That wasn't in love. Lord, forgive me. See, I am a preacher of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Everybody in this room that is born again and filled with the Holy Ghost has been called, anointed, and appointed to preach. That means to proclaim and to herald the death, burial, and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Every single born-again, spirit-filled child of God in this room has been anointed, appointed, and commissioned to go and tell people what God has done for you. Jesus Christ did not die and rise again and give us the Holy Ghost so that we can just come in here and warm seats. Ouch. He didn't even birth this thing called the church so that we can have a little shake and run around the room and have a move of the Holy Ghost every Sunday. Jesus Christ didn't die so we could have good church services. I love good church services. I love to laugh in the spirit. I love to be so drunk in the Holy Ghost I can't get up off the floor. <laughs> Hallelujah. Glory. But that's not why Jesus died. Jesus birthed this thing called the church so that his church would be the church and do what Luke 14, 23 says and go into the highways and the hedges and compel them out there to come in to the Father's house so that it may be full. He called us and saved us to send us. What's the first thing he did? Excuse me, the last thing he did before he went to heaven he commissioned his church to go and make disciples. That's our job. He wants us to be a home, yes. He wants us to be a plug, yes. Because until you find this place as home, the Father's house, until you're plugged in and are taught the Word of God, amen, and grow in grace and in the knowledge of knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ until you know who you are in Christ you can't tell others who they are in Christ so you have to know that I am a child of the living God I am not a sinner saved by grace 
I was a sinner on my way to a devil's hell, dead in sins and trespasses, but he became sin for me, hallelujah, so that I would become the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. And now he's given me a new name. He's given me a new identity. He's given me a new blood, hallelujah, saved, washed, and redeemed by the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Give him praise in this house, church. Hallelujah. And he did it to send us out. That's what a hub is. A hub is a center of activity where we're sent out from to go and get the harvest and bring them in. Do you ever, you ever read that scripture? Hallelujah. I saw this last night. I about fell out of my chair. Glory. You ever prayed that scripture or read that scripture where it said, Pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest that he'd send laborers into his harvest. For the fields are white unto harvest. The harvest is plenteous, but the laborers are a few. You ever notice in the Gospels, Jesus talks in a roundabout way sometimes. I'll give you an example. He gets to the end of the Sermon on the Mount and then he says, Be ye perfect, even as your Father in heaven is perfect. Leaving them with an impossible goal. He done preached for three chapters about what they're to do, and they get to the end and say, well, I can't do this. The same way the law pointed them to their inability, so did Christ. Christ pointed them to their inability to keep the word of God apart from him. See, he was, he was laying a foundation, you need me. You need the blood of Jesus. You need the Holy Ghost, Amen. Have you ever thought when you're praying, Father, send laborers into the harvest, you're praying for yourself? You're not praying for preachers. You're not praying for apostles and prophets and evangelists and pastors and teachers. You're praying, here I am, God, send me. Because the, the fields, they're white unto harvest. The harvest is plenteous, but the laborers are few. Here I am, God. Send me. Because what do we just read in Ephesians? That he gives the fivefold ministry for the equipping of the saints. A baseball player is no good unless he has a bat and a glove. But once they've been equipped and they have the power to do what they've been called to do, there's nothing stopping them. Amen? Amen. See, we as the body of Christ, at least I say for in this house, we've been equipped to go out and do the work of the ministry. We've been equipped, not just taught, not just told, but we've been equipped to go out and do what God has called each and every one of us to do. Because it's going to, in these last days, it is going to take more than the pastors. It is going to take more than the teachers. It's going to take more than the five-fold ministers, not just in this church, but in the body of Christ as a whole. It is going to take all of us to be all that God has called us to be in these last days in order to be a part of what God is doing in the earth. We have to all hunger for more. We have to all desire to see our city and families in revival. Not just a few of us, but all of us. I'll say it again. God never saved you so you can go to church and warm a seat. God saved you to be the church, praise God. God saved you to go tell somebody else what Jesus did for you. God saved me to go tell somebody else you don't have to drink alcohol anymore. You don't have to live that way anymore. You don't have to cuss anymore. You don't have to smoke anymore. You don't have to live like the devil anymore because I've broken the power of the devil off your life by the blood of Jesus. Hallelujah. We ain't got to die and go to hell. That's the best news you can give somebody. You don't have to go to hell. Woo! Hallelujah. You can go to heaven. You can be washed. You can be saved. You can be redeemed. You can be filled with the Holy Ghost. We all have to desire that. Woo! 
We all have to hunger for that. You can't carry a church with four or five prayer warriors. We all got to be praying for this. We all have to want to see revival. Not just a good service, but we've got to want to see it. We've got to go to bed at night saying, Lord, let the line from the baptistry stretch to the back door. Let the altars be filled with women and children, boys and girls, men that the world has discounted and said, he'll never live for God. He'll never go into a church. That's what we got to see in our spirits, all of us, all of us. We have to all want to be filled with the Holy Ghost. Woo! I'm telling you, if you're saved and you're not filled with the Holy Ghost, you're missing it. The baptism in the Holy Ghost ain't optional. Stone me if you want to. But he told those disciples, don't you leave Jerusalem until you've been filled with the power of the Holy Ghost. And if he commanded it to them, the commandment still stands to us. That scripture, just as much as be ye holy, for I am holy. That scripture, just as much as thou shalt not kill. That scripture, just as much as thou shalt not steal. Don't do anything until you first receive power from on high. The promise of the Father. How would you like to promise your children something and they say, Daddy, I don't want it. This ain't optional, saints. I ain't saying you're going to go to hell if you ain't filled with the Holy Ghost. But we ought to be worried about more than just making heaven by the skin of our teeth. Woo! We ought to be worried about taking as many people with us as possible when that trumpet sounds. Hallelujah. Woo, Jesus. Help me, Lord. Help me, Lord. Every Bible-based Christian that's every Christian in the New Testament was filled with the Holy Ghost. And if you want to be a New Testament Christian, you got to be filled with the Holy Ghost. Now, don't take that and say, well, Brother Alex said that I don't speak in tongues, I'm going to hell. That ain't what I said. But, man, if you've been saved for two, three years, four, five years, Two, three days, four, five days, and you don't have a hunger for more of God, something's wrong. Something's wrong. If you don't wake up every morning with a desire to want to know God more, you're backslid. You come in here every time these doors are open. I'm sorry. But if you don't wake up with a hunger in your heart, God, I want more, you're backslid. That's tough. But it's Bible. Man, we're supposed to be saved. We're supposed to be children of God. We're supposed to be the called out ones. We shouldn't be worried about, well, I got I to gotta fit in with that. We were never called to fit in. We were called out of darkness into his marvelous light. And if we can set on that truth without telling nobody, I have a feeling we don't know what we really have if we've got it at all. He saved us to go and compel them to come in so that his father's house would be full. We can't say, well, this is good for some and this isn't good for, for me. You know, I don't need to have all that. Yes, we do. Yes, we do. I'm going to read one verse. You don't have to turn there, but it's in 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Paul said this right into the church at Corinth. And the church at Corinth was jacked up, to put it honestly. They were messed up. And he said, you, so that you are not lacking in any gift, speaking of the gifts of the Spirit, while waiting for the revelation of the Lord Jesus Christ, he will strengthen you to the end so that you may be blameless on the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is faithful, and by him you were called to the fellowship of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. But notice what he says. We should not be lacking in any gift while we're waiting for the revelation of the Lord Jesus Christ. We need the gifts of the Holy Spirit operating in our life. Paul, through the Holy Ghost, 
never told believers individually to pray that God would use them specifically in the gifts of the Spirit. He told the church as a whole to seek the gifts of the Spirit. Now, will God honor faith? A hundred percent. If there's one person in this room that's praying, God, use me in the gifts of the Spirit, he'll do it. Because all he wants is a willing vessel. But God wants the entire body of believers to be praying, God, use me in the gifts of the Spirit and remind him of his word. Bless you. Lord, you said in your word that you divide to everyone, not just the pastors, not just the prophets, you divide to everyone severally as you will the manifestations of the Holy Ghost. That the gifts of the Spirit aren't for the preacher, the pastor, alone. The gifts of the Spirit are for the body of Christ in order to build one another up in love. Amen? We need to seek. We need to desire to be used by God in these last days. Complacency is not an option. Everybody say edified, comforted, and exhorted. See, the first two we like a lot, but we don't always like the exhortation because it's like putting our spirit man up against a grinding wheel. And the burrs start flying off. But I need to hear this just as much as everybody else in this room needs to hear this. That we were called for more. We were called for greater. He said, these signs shall follow them that believe. In my name they shall cast out devils. In my name they will speak with new tongues. In my name they shall lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. In my name if they drink any deadly thing it will not harm them. What a sign of a believer. Somebody try to poison you and you just keep on praising God and worshiping. That's happened. Not just in the Bible but it's happened in modern times. You can hear stories of it. Snake tries to bite you. You just shake him off. Say, glory be to God. Not just physical. I'm talking about devils. When the enemy comes in and tries to attack you and your family, you just shake him off and say, get off of here, devil. I'm a child of the living God. You can't curse me. You can't curse what God has blessed. You can't come against the handmaiden of the Lord. You can't come against the servant of the Lord. Hallelujah. I'm a child of the living God. Learn your place, devil. Glory. You got to know who you are. You got to know who your father is. You got to stand firm in the face. It, it, it says resist the devil firmly in the faith. Hallelujah. God wants his church to be a home, to be a plug and to be a hub. God wants his church, his church, to be a place where we can always call home no matter what, no matter how bad the week's been, no matter how bad the enemy's been trying to take you out, no matter what the enemy's doing to your children and to your family, a place where we can come in with our brothers and sisters and just be real. Sister, I've had a bad week. My kids are living like hell. But God, their names are on that board, and they shall be saved, and they're going to be written over on that other board because I broke the power of the devil off their life in the authority of the name of Jesus. See, we need people to come alongside of us that have faith and strengthen our faith. A plug, a place where we can come in and get plugged in, not just come to church from time to time, not just run to God like a medicine cabinet when we need an Advil, but a place where we can get plugged in and taught and edified and comforted and exhorted and built up as the church. Which should drive us to want more. And a hub. A place where we're sent out from to go and get the harvest and bring them in. 
a place where the servants go out into the fields and bring in the sheaves so that the barn of the Lord will be filled. Hallelujah. So we've been empowered to do it. We've been taught the word. We've been edified. We've been built up. Jesus did everything that we need him to do at that cross almost 2,000 years ago. He defeated the devil. He gave us authority. He washed away our sins. He opened up the door so the blessings in the storehouse of heaven would belong to us as joint heirs with Christ and heirs of God. He gave us authority over all the powers of the enemy. He gave us the promise of the Father, the gift of the Holy Ghost. I just wonder how many of us would be willing to say, God, here I am, use 